Hi, welcome to our study, our online series called The Hall of Faith. Tonight we're in lesson five. We're going to talk about Isaac, and our text will be Hebrews chapter 11, 20, and Genesis 25, 26, and 27. So join with me. Grab your Bible. Before we get started, let's pray. Our Father God, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for this lesson and, and your word, and we ask Father, that your word would help grow our faith as we look to you, and we thank you for the examples in Scripture uh, on faith that honors you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's read Hebrews 11, verse 20, and it says, <clears throat> By faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau in regard to their future. Stephen J. Cole, in his commentary on Isaac, writes, The story behind Hebrews 11, 20 is not flattering to any of the participants except for Isaac's faith regarding things to come. Isaac seemed to be more interested in a tasty meal than in God's prophetic word. Esau was a profane man who had despised his spiritual heritage for a bowl of stew. Rebekah deliberately deceived her husband and encouraged her son to lie. Jacob agreed to go along with the lies, taking advantage of his blind father. It seems to me like this story is, is one of a, of a dysfunctional family. It seems like it's a mess. But yet, out of all this mess, God's purposes came into fruition. And this is where we're looking at our purpose. God's purpose isn't dependent upon human intervention. God fulfills his promises even when it seems impossible. Well, let's start with our first question tonight. Read Hebrews 11.20. It was by faith that Isaac blessed the future of Jacob and Esau. How did Isaac act by faith when he was deceived? Well, the author of Hebrews doesn't go into detail concerning the difference uh, between the blessings of Jacob and Esau. He doesn't go into uh, ex ex extraordinary details of this stuff. But the emphasis that he has is on the faith of Isaac. The faith that Isaac acted upon. His faith was that God would fulfill the prophetic blessings in the future. Isaac didn't even know what he was doing. He was deceived into blessing Jacob instead of Esau. Well, let's begin with looking at a few of Isaac's strengths and weaknesses. We're going to look at his weaknesses first. In Genesis 25, 28, what does this passage reveal? Let's look at that. It says, Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Isaac and Rebekah both demonstrated favoritism. Isaac liked Esau better than Jacob. He had more in common with Esau, where Rebekah liked Jacob more than Esau. She had more in common with Jacob. And we see this pairing up in these, in these passages. Well, what problems did this lead to? Question number three. Well, whenever there is favoritism, what happens is a pitting of one against the other. And so this pitted the two, the two sons against one another. Instead of equal, equally loving both, the favoritism ushered in a treatment that was different for each one. One got preferential treatment from one and the other didn't, and vice versa. C. This led to deception, manipulation, and hurt feelings. Rebecca, as she favored Jacob, set up the plan for deceiving Isaac, and this was for giving of the blessing that was meant for the older. And she wanted Isaac or Jacob to get that. Well, question number four, read Genesis 26, 6 to 7. What example of Abraham did Isaac follow, and why is this so wrong? Let's turn to Genesis 26. So Isaac stayed in Gerar. When the men of that place asked him about his wife, he said, she is my sister, because he was afraid to say, she is my wife. He thought the men of this place might kill me on account of Rebekah, because she is beautiful. Isaac repeated the same habit of his father Abraham. Abraham did that twice, and Isaac lied and said that Rebekah was his sister. That would be A. B. Isaac considered his own safety over Rebekah's safety. And this is where we come to C. This lie actually put Rebekah in a very vulnerable position, even dangerous. 
Question number five, a summary of Genesis 27 reveals much about Isaac and his family. Write down a few of these issues. I'm going to just summarize these for you because of uh, time's sake tonight, we're just going to go over these. So the first one is this, that Isaac is disengaged. He's in the dark about what's happening in his family. B, there's a lot of manipulation, bitterness, scheming, and hurt feelings in this chapter. C, Rebecca and Jacob team up, team up together to get Isaac's blessing. D, Jacob deceives Esau to get the birthright. E, Esau later schemes against Jacob to try to kill him for taking his birthright and his blessing. F, when Rebekah hears of Esau's plan to kill Jacob, Rebekah comes up with a plan to send Jacob to her family. This is seen in Genesis chapter 27, verses 41 to 46. G, Rebekah once again manipulates her husband to send Jacob off. The whole story is a, one of manipulation and scheming and all this craftiness to try to get one's desired outcome. Let's identify some strengths that Isaac had. This is question number six. Genesis chapter 22, 9 and 10. The strength displayed is obedience. In this chapter, it says that, that uh, Isaac, as a boy, didn't overpower his father and resist. He trusted. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. Well, he trusted his father completely. He didn't offer any resistance. And so he was obedient. Fortunately, the angels of the Lord stepped in. This was only a test. This was a test of Abraham's faith in God. B, Genesis 24, 62 to 67. We see patience here. Now Isaac came from Beer Le Hoi Roy. He went out to the field one evening to meditate, and as he looked up, he saw camels approaching. Rebekah also looked up and saw Isaac. She got down from her camel and asked the servant, Who is that man in the field coming to meet us? He is my master, the servant answered. So she took her veil and covered her face. Then the servant told Isaac all he had done. Isaac brought her into his, the tent of his mother, Sarah, and he married Rebekah. So she became his wife, and he loved her, and Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. And Abraham was a very old man by the time Rebekah became Isaac's wife. Isaac was 40 years old at that time. In Genesis 26, six, we come to this one. The strength displayed is faith in God. The previous one was patience. This one is faith in God. The Lord appeared to Isaac and said, Do not go down to Egypt in the land, to live in the land I tell you to live. Stay in this land for a while, and I will be with you, and I will bless you. For, you, for to you and your descendants, I will give you all these lands and will confirm the oath I swore to your father Abraham. I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and will give them all these lands. And through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because Abraham obeyed me and kept my requirements, my commands, my decrees, and my laws. So Isaac stayed in Gerar. Isaac is seen here as a man who heard God's voice. He had faith. He heard God's voice. He also walked in the promise of God. This was first given to his father Abraham, and God reiterated this promise to Isaac. It was transferred now to Isaac. In D, we see Genesis 26, 12 to 22, that Isaac is a peacemaker. Isaac planted crops. In that same year, he reaped a hundredfold because the Lord blessed him. The man became rich and his wealth continued to grow until he became very wealthy. He had so many flocks and herds and servants that the Phil Philistines envied him. So all the wells that his father's servants had dug in the time of his father Abraham, the, the Philistines stopped up, filling them with earth. Verse 16 says, Then Abimelech, Abimelech said to Isaac, 
move away from us. You have become too powerful for us. So Isaac moved away from there and encamped in the valley of Gerar and settled there. Isaac reopened the wells that had been dug in the time of his father Abraham, which the Philistines had stopped. They stopped up after Abraham died, and he gave them the same names his father had given them. Isaac's servants dug in the valley and discovered a well of fresh water there. But the herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with Isaac's herdsmen and said, The water is ours. So he named the well Essek because they disputed with him. Then they dug another well, but they quarreled over that one also. So he named it Sitna. He moved on from there and dug another well, and no, no one quarreled over it. He named it Rehoboth, saying, Now the Lord has given us room, and we will flourish in the land. The interesting thing here about Isaac is he didn't get angry and, and fight. He took the high road, and he, instead of giving in to anger and frustration, he chose the high road by digging other wells. A lot of work, but he was a peacemaker. Peacemaking takes commitment, it takes effort, and this is what we see with Isaac. Now we turn to the blessing of Jacob. In question 7, it says, read Genesis 25, 22 to 23. What did God reveal to Rebekah about the twins she was carrying? What is the unusual piece to this? The babies jostled each other within her, and she said, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. The Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. So Rebecca goes and inquires of the Lord because the babies within her are jostling one another. They were nations, God reveals. The older will serve the younger. That is what is so unusual about this, because in this culture, the older would serve would be over the younger, and the younger would serve the older. Question eight. Obviously, Isaac knew about God's will for the younger son, Jacob. In spite of knowing this, what did he do anyway? Was this deliberate? Let's look at Genesis 27, 1 to 4. When Isaac was old and his eyes were so weak that he could no longer see, he called for Esau, his older son, and said to him, my son, here I am, he answered. Isaac said, I am now an old man and don't know the day of my death. Now then, get your weapons, your quiver and your bow, and go out to the open country to hunt some wild game for me. Prepare me the kind of tasty food that I like and bring it to me to eat, so that I may give you my blessing before I die. So in this text, we see that Isaac was going to give Esau his blessing. Isaac was probably doing so out of the tradition of blessing the oldest son. The only thing he didn't do is inquire of the Lord concerning the word that was given to Rebekah at the birth of the twins. It was at that time that God did reveal what his purpose was, his plan. The older will serve the younger. Question number nine. Read Genesis 25, 27 to 34. As Jacob secures the birthright of Esau, what is revealed as to how each viewed the birthright? What is the, the lesson for us through their example? The, here's what this passage says. It says, The boys grew up, and Esau became a skillful, skillful hunter, a man of the open country, while Jacob was a quiet man, staying among the tents. Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country, famished. He said to Jacob, quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. That is why he is also called Edom. Verse 31, Jacob replied, first sell me your birthright. Look, I'm about to die, Esau said. What good is the birthright to me? But Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank and then got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. What happened here is that 
Jacob was an opportunist. He saw an opportunity that he could not pass up. Esau put his appetite over his birthright. It was nothing more than a tool to barter with. It was of no value to him except for a bowl of stew. Verse 27 sums it up in the fact that Esau despised his birthright. Jacob looked at the birthright as something that was highly valuable and would do anything to get it. Esau and Jacob represented two types of people. The first one is represented in Esau. He treated his birthright with contempt. There are some people that treat spiritual and eternal things with contempt. They see no use or no value in them. The second is Jacob. Jacob saw the birthright as of something of great value. He ended up serving himself to obtain it. He did so through his craftiness and manipulation. Some people treat spiritual and, and eternal things in the same way. They make such things into higher, to such a higher cause that it begins to serve themselves. They think of themselves as more spiritual or whatever. They put their cause higher when it comes to eternal things, making themselves look better. That's what we're trying to say. Question 10, Jacob would later learn from God that God's promises are not acquired through crafty manipulation. What is required to receive God's promise? For the answer to this question, we turn to Romans chapter 4, verse 16. It says, therefore, the promise comes by faith so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham. He's the father of us all. The point here is th that the promises of God come through faith. The promises of God are released by faith. Question 11. What is the importance of the Father's blessing in this culture at this time? Well, the, the Father would bless the oldest son, and the blessing involved the giving of a double portion of the family inheritance to this son, the firstborn son. So a double portion of the inheritance. Prophetic words were also spoken over the son regarding his future. Question number 12, Genesis 27, 27 to 29, records the blessing of Jacob. This was to be Esau's blessing. Even though this blessing was received through deceit, how did Isaac respond when he found out the truth? Genesis 27, 33. When Isaac found out the truth that he had been deceived, it says that he trembled violently. He didn't revoke the blessing in anger. He finally realized God's word for Rebekah and the older will serve the younger. And he honored that. He said, I blessed him and indeed he will be blessed. So Isaac accepted the word. And even through all this manipulation. Well, what is the whole lesson from this story of a dysfunctional family? What trying to manipulate things for their own purposes, what can we gain through this? Well, we are reminded of this. The story reveals the importance of trusting God, even when circumstances seem to contradict his promises. And we see that today. Today, sir, today with all the challenges going on, we seem like we're in, in times where, where are God's promises? Well, when it seems impossible for God's promises to be fulfilled, without our help, instead of God, trusting God in circumstances, we sometimes try to manipulate these circumstances in our favor. Manipulation never works. It didn't work then, and it doesn't work now. Well, real faith is this, trusting God to do things His way. Our purpose is to live to glorify God in and with our lives. We need, we need to trust Him with our faith. Remember, Romans 4, 16, the promise comes by faith. And even through the lesson of this manipulation of this family and each one they're in, kind of everybody's out for themselves. They all understood that when all was said and done, God had his way anyway. God overshadowed all of their dysfunction. And what we know from this 
this lesson tonight is that there's one man who demonstrated faith and his name was Isaac. And he didn't realize it at first, but later on, even when he was being manipulated, he saw God work in spite of everything that they did. And he's known as a man of faith and he blessed his sons in faith. Well, let's pray. Our Father, thank you for the lesson tonight. And help us, Lord, to trust you, even when times seem crazy, even when circumstances seem to be out of control. Help us to stop and remember that you are the God who keeps his promises. We want to surrender to you and trust you fully. And we thank you for the, this reminder tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thanks for tuning in. God bless you. May you have a great rest of the day and a wonderful rest of the week. We'll see you next time.